Hi everybody, it's Sharon. We're almost to the end of the year. I want to wish all of you a very happy new year. And while you're at it, how are you planning to celebrate? Are you planning to have a party late into the evening? Have you made some New Year's resolutions? Well, whatever the way you're going to celebrate, I want to talk a little bit about one of those things that can make your party a little bit more special, and that is sparkling wine or champagne and how it all came to be. Let's take a closer look. Our story begins in northeastern France, about a hundred miles east of Paris, in the valley of the River Marne. The area has been planted to grapes for centuries, but the cool climate gives it a short growing season, and there are other risks, like being on the most strategic route between Paris and Germany, putting it at risk every time there was a war. Underneath the city of Reims, there are over 200 kilometers of caves carved out of his chalk and limestone subsoil. These are useful for storing champagne at a constant temperature, but also for hiding from bombing raids during World War I. And here we also find the three grapes from which champagne is made, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and Pinot Noir. In the Middle Ages, the French considered bubbles in their wine to be a problem. The bubbles could cause the wine bottles to explode. It was called the devil's wine. In the 1660s, the Benedictine monk Dom Perignon was charged with solving the problem. We have no record today that Dom Perignon ever figured out how to get bubbles out of wine, but we do know that the English figured it out it was the English scientist Christopher Merritt who understood that fermentation was continuing in the corked bottles, creating carbon dioxide bubbles and sometimes resulting in an explosion. Fortunately, the English made stronger glass bottles using hotter coal-fired furnaces, and they liked the bubbles, so they started to intentionally add sugar to the bottles for more fermentation. Back in France, the court of Versailles was developing a taste for sparkling wine, now known as Champagne, and both new and established wineries were starting to produce it. This new beverage was a lot sweeter than what we know today, and was made from blended grapes, often from different years, due to the unpredictability of the weather. One of the most noted of these wineries was run by a woman, a widow, widowed at 27 in 1805. Her name was Barb Nicole Ponsardin Clicquot, and today we know her as Veuve Clicquot. In the early years of her business, she was plagued by Napoleon's wars, and it wasn't until 1814 that she finally had success. And her brand on every cork and anchor and a star are reminders of those early years. The Veuve Clicquot was also responsible for developing a system of removing unwanted sediment from bottles by twisting and turning the bottles in a rack. Called remuage by the French, it's still in use today. Today in Champagne, there are over 85,000 acres planted to grapes, 20,000 growers, and 260 Champagne houses producing over 300 million bottles a year. The weather is still unpredictable, and the French government strictly controls which grapes are planted where. No surprise then that in the 1970s and 80s, some of the largest champagne houses have set up shop in California. The weather is more predictable, and in California, you can experiment with new grapes and blends. One of the first was Domaine Chandon in 1973, followed by Mum in Napa in 1976, and later Roterer in 1982. In 1987, Claude Tatinger built Domaine Carneros in the Carneros region, highly resembling Chateau Marqueterie, his estate in Champagne, France. And California also had its own independent producers, like the Corbell brothers in Sonoma or Schramsberg by the Davies family in Calistoga. No matter what your preference, I hope you'll enjoy a glass of sparkling wine for your next celebration. Happy New Year.
Thanks for joining me today. Catch you later. Bye.